Hi, welcome everybody and happy anniversary. We are so happy to be here today to uh, welcome to TPAC's Inside Out discussion, which is her flag, a suffrage celebration. I'm Kristen Dare Horsley. I work at TPAC and I'll be your host and your moderator today. Thank you to Kelsey Daly, who also works at TPAC. She's gonna monitor the chat and, um, and our guests as well. The reason why we're here is because of artist Marilyn Artis, who created the Her Flag project. So we're gonna turn it over to her and let her tell us about the project and introduce Higgins to us. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm an artist and an activist from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And I'm also a super suffrage nerd. And when I realized this anniversary was coming up, the 100th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment, I knew I wanted to do something. And I spent a lot of time thinking about what I was gonna do. And I came up with the idea of traveling to all 36 states in order of ratification over 14 months, taking 17 trips, and partnering with a woman artist representing each state and in a public performance in each capital city, sewing a stripe on that they had created and to create a massive bohemoth 18 foot by 26 foot flag representing and celebrating this huge anniversary. So I began working on this project in 2017 and I'm not gonna geek out about all the incredible uh, things that have happened. Herflag.com uh, has all of our information. So after you watch this, you should for sure go check out that website. So I am here with Higgins Bond, who created the Tennessee Stripe, and I'm so happy to meet her in person. <laughs> Thank you, Higgins, for Thank being you. here. Thank you. So to be here. Um, I'm going to read her artist, her bio. Uh, Higgins Bond has been a freelance illustrator and fine artist for over 40 years. She earned a BFA degree in advertising design from the Memphis College of Art. She has received many honors, such as a Medal of Honor from the Governor Bill Clinton, the, 20, uh, the 2007 Green Earth Award for illustrating A Place for Butterflies, and the 2009 Ashley Bryan Award for Outstanding Contributions to Children's Literature. Her book, A Place for Turtles, did you bring that book too? Yes, I did. Yeah, <laughs> she's got the book right there, by Melissa Stewart, was the winner of the 2014 Green Earth Award and the Sigford F. Olson Nature Writing Award for Children's Literature. She has exhibited work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York City, and the Disabled Museum of African American Art in Chicago, Illinois. She is the illustrator of three Black Heritage stamps for the United States Postal Service and four stamps for the United Nations Postal Administration on Endangered Species. She is the first African-American woman ever to illustrate a stamp for the United States Postal Service. Many of her original images have been published by some of this country's largest collectible plate companies. She also has, has illustrated over 40 books for both children and adults and created three paintings for the Great Kings and Queens of Africa poster series for Anheuser-Busch. She is a member of the Society of Illustrators and her clients include such notable names as the Bradford Exchange, McGraw-Hill Publishers, Peachtree Publishers, the Franklin Mint, NBC Television, Hennessy Cognac, basically everybody, <laughs> Hennessy, the Black uh, Enterprise Magazines, Frito-Lay and Columbia House, holy cow. Um, <laughs> wow, Tennessee. Uh, yeah, you got an incredible woman representing you today. Almost makes me want to cry. Oh, I cry a lot. But thank you. Um, so I am here to sew on Tennessee Stripe right here, right now, live in this gorgeous auditorium. I wish you all were here with us, but we are making do, and you're here with us virtually. So um, I'm just going to get to work here sewing, um, and Higgins is going to hang out with me, and we're going to turn it over to TPAC and this incredible panel. I would love, um, as Marilyn starts sewing, I'd love Higgins for you to just say a few words about how you came to this project and then what your inspiration was right away. Oh, well, uh, this has been quite an honor for me to be part of this. I, I've never particip participated in a group effort like this, and they came to me and asked me if I wanted to represent Tennessee, and of course I was happy to do that. Uh, I think as an African-American woman, I wanted to highlight some of the uh, African-American women 
that were instrumental in uh, the suffragette movement and the civil rights movement. A lot of the ladies like Ida B. Wells and um, Mary Church Terrell, Rosa Parks, Ella Baker, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. I wanted to highlight people that were involved in the struggle to um, bring about voting for everyone. Uh, when the 19th Amendment was uh, uh, came about, it gave mostly white women the freedom to vote, but it still took a long time and a struggle for everyone. I don't think until the 1967 uh, Voter Rights Amendment came along did we really fully get the right to vote. So I wanted to highlight that struggle for, for all women because um, it's been a long road. And as you said at first, it's like we're still struggling to keep the vote. So uh, it's an honor to be part of it. So I'm going to get started. I'm going to introduce our panel. And uh, I think you have the digital program in, uh, in the chat if you want to look, if you want to read their bios. I'm going to introduce them by name. Rebecca Price, she is with Chick History. And she is, I mean, everything women's history, just ask her. <laughs> she is, she's fantastic. Debbie Gold, she's with the, um, uh, what is the complete title, Debbie? It's the League of Women Voters of Tennessee. And they are doing such great work, even still. And so go visit their website and uh, to learn all about the current work that they're doing for right now. And Andrea Blackman is with the Public Library. And fun fact, she and Rebecca just, am I right in saying this, you just completed the Votes for Women room at the library and it has officially opened today. Although Andrea, is it even, is it open to the public? Not yet, but virtually at 12 o'clock it will be. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on the panel. I'm honored to have you. And I, wanna, I would love to start with Rebecca and just to give us a history, a quick history of the movement and, um, and how all this got started 72 years ago. When I think about the suffrage movement, um, two things. I, generally, we hear that 72 years a lot, Seneca Falls to, to 1920. Um, and I really think it's important to push that narrative out and that, that timeline out a little bit more because then you can truly understand it as a socio-political movement. Um, yes, it's a little bit women's rights. It's a little bit women's equality. Um, but it is also a lot about American democracy, American citizenship, um, and how with each passing generation, we are going to figure out how do we define citizenship? How do we find engagement? <laughs> how are we going to become citizens and engage with our, our democracy? And so when you can push it back past Seneca Falls, you see women um, going into public spaces and having these questions already about trying to participate in their government and becoming that way. So I really think about it as um, these regional movements that Hold started it. in the Northeast, um, very grassroots, um, and then spread as our country spread as well, and the boundaries of our country spread. We go out west, we oh go you know, to the south, and as we're expanding. Um, so I really think of it as these regional movements that become stronger and stronger post-Civil War into the 1900s, and then with World War I, um, we have this full-blown national movement that has really focused its attention on a federal amendment that will protect the right, or you can no longer deny the right to vote based on sex, which is really what the 19th Amendment did. So it's not necessarily a guarantee or a protector that all women are gonna vote. Mm -hmm. It just says it's one less obstacle for women to get to the ballot. Um, so with that history in mind, it starts in the Northeast where most of the socio-political movements in America start is, is in the Northeast and it spreads, it spreads out. The Western states, for lack of population, most of them are gonna allow women to vote out West too. So we're seeing suffrage out there. Um, and then when it comes to the South, it comes very late. Um, the South has always been wary of Northern movements. Um, they know that the Northeastern grassroots movements, they kind of are very much tied to abolition. Um, we're past, you know, we're post-Civil War. Um, so the Southern states really pick it up late when they start um, thinking about should women be enfranchised with the vote 
and how they're going to participate politically. Um, so they work, the, so women start working for this in clubs. Um, they form their own groups. Um, they will form the National Association, National American Women Suffrage Association, NASWA, There's, which is a combination of two um, that brought together. So you really see this, you start to see this institutionalization of, of women and their work. Um, the other thing that's important to know is the suffrage movement had the least amount of members of all the reform going on during this time period. Um, and actually the most popular one was gonna be temperance. And that's how a lot of Southern women got involved um, in the suffrage movement is through their temperance work. Um, and so when you think about a socio-political movement and how the suffragists are going to achieve their goal, really what they do is they start convincing all the other reformers that you need the ballot to achieve the reform you're working on. So that's education reform, temperance, uh, racial justice, um, any of the work that the African Americans are doing, um, it's really through convincing them that if you have the ballot, you can affect your change can become more permanent. Um, so that's what I think it's really important to think about with the suffrage movement and and you know really what it was was about knowing the importance of the vote to the cause that you wanted to work for. Um, is is really a good way of thinking about it when you think about it in a socio political way. Um. So talk to us about, you know, Maryland's creating a flag. What is the, the, the symbolism of the, having a flag during this movement and, and just our women's history in particular? Yes, um, this project I think is a fantastic commemoration project. Um, the flag is one, a very important symbol um, to all countries, to all democracies, right? Um, and it's a very important part of women's work. Um, flag making was, was women's business. And I, uh, Marilyn, I had want, can I ask Marilyn a question? Mm -hmm. I, had, I believe I had heard that part of your inspiration was um, Mary Pickersgill and the Star Spangled Banner, the, the Fort McHenry flag? Yes, am okay. I on, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I wanted to make sure that I remember that correctly because I want to start that answer back then um, because th this is Mary Pickersgill um, along with um, likely her mother, her daughter, two nieces, and a freed African-American apprentice made that star-spangled banner, um, which Francis Scott Key wrote and it inspired the national anthem, and this flag is now at the Smithsonian American um, History Museum. And um, it's important to know that during this time period, these flag makers, these are all women. Betsy Ross is the one most people remember. Um, so they're very much a part of this, this revolutionary period and these identifying with Ameri American patriotism and symbols. And that's women making that. And I think it's important that we think about it that way is, um, you know, not just going onto the battlefield as a way to express your patriotism or how are you going to get involved in the government that you identify with. So they're, they're working on those things. And it is also their business. We think of it now, um, you know, as maybe just kind of women's work. Um, and it's something that has, we've, for some of us through our 21st century eyes, we don't understand what it was like 200 years ago. Marilyn is an artist who makes her money and her livelihood on flag making. So she's very much um, carrying on that tradition of these women 200 years ago. We sometimes think of it, at least in my family, you know, if you sewed, it, it was, you know, something that you did for maybe for your kids and your clothing, but we forget how much of, of women's work and women's business it was. And they were running their businesses, taking commissions and going into public work. So that idea of a flag and patriotism is, is very, very important. So then I want to flash forward to the suffrage movement and another famous flag, which is the ratification banner. And this was a PR project that came out of the National Women's Party, which is what Alice Paul led. Um, and this movement, National Women's Party is very late to the game as, as an organization. Um, they, they, they start up in the 1910s and then form their own organization um, uh, around 1916, 1917. And Alice Paul is, really as a tactician and PR and strategy is very good about keeping suffrage in the public eye. So nobody forgets that we're working for this movement. 
and most famously was the 1913 suffrage parade before Woodrow Wilson was inaugurated. But she also did the ratification banner. And so once the 19th Amendment passed out of Congress and it went to all the states, every time a state ratified, affirmed it, she would sew a star, a gold star onto this banner. And it was purple, white, and yellow. And there are these pictures of Alice Paul and all the other members of the National Women's Party sewing this banner. And they're very much recreating paintings and other kind of patriarchal, patri patri patriotic, iconograph uh, iconic images of Betsy Ross sewing that American flag, right? Birthing the nation through her women's work. And they're recreating these when they're taking these PR pictures and sending them out. And it's also a very domestic, uh, we get this very domestic sense of, you know, again, seamstress work. So she's also trying to show that play on, um, you, you know, don't be too scared of us as women. You know, we, we, we're still um, this kind of ideal womanhood. We're still, we're coming off of the Victorian era of the Victorian womanhood. So every time a state ratifies, she sews on a gold star. And then of course, you know, to kind of put it, you know, fully answer my first question, the 19th Amendment lands in Tennessee. Um, almost every other state had ratified it. Um, almost all the Southern states had rejected it. Um, a couple of states are not going to call a general session. Um, and so they're very much running out of time um, because just a couple of more states could reject it and then it's, you know, it's out of the game. There, yes, that's the ratification banner. Um, so the 19th Amendment lands in Tennessee and um, they don't want it here because it's a Southern state because they've all rejected it um, because it, it comes with a big price of African-American women being um, possibly allowed to vote um, if, if they can get into it. So August 18th, 19, 1920, Tennessee ratifies. Telegram is sent up to the uh, headquarters of the National Women's Party, which um, in DC, and they sew on that 36 star for Tennessee. And then she unfurls it across the banner at the headquarters. Um, so again, what Marilyn has done, this idea, I, I just think it's a great commemorative, historically relevant twist on this ratification banner. Um, we had the 30, Alice Paul had her 36 stars um, and we've got our, our, our 36 stripes for each state. So I think it's just a wonderful reflective way to have to commemorate this. And I'll just end by saying um, this ratification banner is now uh, lost to us in history. We, don't, we do not know where it is. Really? Um, so it's one of those iconic things from the movement, but we don't, we don't know where its whereabouts are. It's been lost to history. That's amazing. So maybe somebody has it, unknowingly has it in their attic or something. Maybe. <laughs> so, well, I'd love to talk a little bit more about, um, and Andrea, you can speak to this, about, you know, the voting experience of, of women over time and just a more complete history because uh, what, as Rebecca said, the, you know, the suffrage movement was, was beneficial to a certain group and not mm -hmm. necessarily everyone. So can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Sure, sure. I think um, Higgins did an amazing job of introducing us to some figures as her inspiration and we think about um, the people that she was inspired by to create her piece um, and we also have to add those voices to this narrative and hopefully you all can hear me okay because my screen is going in and out so text me Rebecca if you cannot hear me. So okay. one of the things as we think about other voices in a more complete history. Um, we have to think about the role that all women played. We have to think about, you know, this idea of the suffrage movement being specifically gender centric. We have to think about the view of voting rights and as it was argued by some groups, you know, it was argued that, you know, black women had unique needs that were defined much by by race, as they were by gender, as they, as they were by region, making it clear that for some, it was less about a political candidate, about a political slant um, in gender, but it was more about her plight as an African-American woman. So beyond that, um, 
we have to look at all these voices. One that came, comes to mind is I'm thinking about um, Fanny Barrier Williams, who's a contemporary of Ida B. Wells. You know, when we think about her role and what she did in Chicago, she's not a Tennessean, but her role as it relates to the profound impact she had as a grassroots activist. Um, she started, you know, looking at women and looking at gender and took on this holistic view of universal rights. And many of the African-American women believe that. Um, they believe that the issue of suffrage was far too large and complex for one group of people, for one organization, for one set of anyone to tackle it alone. They hope that different groups would work together, um, that they would accomplish this idea of a shared goal. So you have African-American suffragists like Nanny Helen Burroughs who wrote about this idea of working across lines and being cooperative and trying to get the right to vote. Um, African-American women worked really hard with mainstream suffragists and organizations as Rebecca mentioned. But however, some of these mainstream organizations did not address the challenges that were faced by black women you know, because of race. No one was addressing the idea of negative stereotypes that we that they were seeing in the media or harassment or unequal access to housing or jobs or education um, or lack of a platform. And I know Debbie mentioned um, earlier before we started these parallels between 100 years and now. So mm -hmm. since the late 1800s, you know, you have African-American women in clubs and organizations who are specifically looking at issues that impact their community and impact them. And so we have this precursor to Kimberly um, Crenshaw's intersectionality, and we have to add in what it meant for all of these other voices. You have novelists like uh, Frances Ellen Harper, who said that she was going to fight for rights, rights in a universal standpoint, and that white women and, and other suffragists could not be complacent complacent um, in dealing with issues of supremacy and issues of racism. So a lot of what we were seeing at the same time, all of this beautiful history, and as we are memorializing, we see the complexity of what gender and race um, meant to so many people. This idea of fairness and who was fighting for fairness, but it was fairness in the abstract and not necessarily um, of this, this outward proclamation of what's fair and what's just. Yeah, I, I find that so fascinating, and it, and it is fascinating too, like what Rebecca was saying about the different regions and out west, you know, the women, they voted for so many years earlier than people in the south, and um, it's just amazing to me the regional differences, like what you were saying, and because think about us now, we are so connected, you know, for better or for worse, um, we could uh, through, to people throughout the world, and so we can we know we can know almost immediately what somebody across the globe is going right. through personally. But um, you know, for our history and and this particular uh, movement, it's amazing how it was just rippled over time, and that some people had rights so much earlier, and and then it just took so long. That's just amazing to me. So, but Debbie, I'd love for you to address. Um, so once we, we did get the right to vote, we, we, we won the right to vote, did women vote? And, and, and talk to us about voter eligibility and, and like what Andrea was saying, addressing what they were you know, going through in their specific regions. How, how did all that play into us getting a vote? Well, I mean, I think first of all, we'd have to say that one of the interesting things that I've been very engaged with with the League of Women Voters was the idea that when the League of Women Voters was started uh, it, and Tennessee had its first meeting in May of 1920 when the suffrage uh, association officially became the League of Women Voters, which was a very optimistic statement since it hadn't happened yet. But it also was an understanding that once women had the right to vote, they also needed the knowledge of what to do with it. And that we couldn't just assume that people who had never voted before understood both the process and also the issues that they would be voting on and how it would take place. So um, it was interesting looking at 1920, yeah, did women vote? Yes, but not in the numbers you might have expected. So in 1920, there were roughly 26 million 750,000 votes, which was only an 8 million 
um, vote increase from the previous presidential election of 1916. And the estimate is it's about 36% of eligible voters. And of course, to Andrea's point, of course, not everyone was eligible at that time for a variety of reasons. Um, and that compared with 68% of men in the country. And, and there were a lot of reasons for it. Um, poll tax was one of the reasons. And poll tax, of course, affected African Americans greatly, but it also affected whites too who couldn't afford a poll tax. Um, literacy tests were a big deal. And then there were surprisingly administrative issues and they showed up in parts of the country we might not necessarily think would have had them. So in 1920, um, one of the issues was Arkansas, Georgia, Mississippi, and South Carolina. Gosh darn it, you guys just voted too late on women's suffrage. We just can't arrange our poll tax and registration deadlines in time. So in those four states, women could not vote for the presidential election in 1920. And then there were other places like Connecticut that added a, moral, a, a morals clause to voter registration and extended the residency requirements for women. So there were a lot of ways that, what we say, organizationally states weren't necessarily compliant with it. And it took a while to work out those mechanics. And then of course, um, there was inexperience in voting and also the cultural norms that we talked about earlier and those don't just change overnight. They, they evolve over time. The idea that essentially when women were voting, essentially, was it a statement that they didn't trust their husband to make good judgments for the family? That was, that, you know, if they were in charge of the family, well, they should be making the decisions. And it was almost like undermining their authority or their decision-making ability. So um, a lot of that took time to evolve. And of course, it wasn't, it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that African Americans had the full right to vote. Um, and, um, and surprisingly, even after 1920, there were lots of groups that didn't have citizenship that we kind of forgotten about. Mm -hmm. So 1923 was when Asian Indians could become citizens. 1924, Native Americans. 1943, immigrants of Chinese ancestry. 1946, Filipinos. And 1952, 1952, when first generation Japanese could become citizens. So we had a long road of even officially getting citizenship, which of course brings us to the present day when yes, people can have citizenship, but there are lots of barriers to voting still. Yeah, so yeah, I, so let's bring it to today. Um, okay. do, does everyone have, and I would love everybody to address this, um, do we all have the right to vote now? Do we have equal rights to vote now? Well, and the biggest one of all in terms of numbers is ex-felons in most states have a very, very difficult road to get their voting rights back. Um, and this, uh, this really uh, impacts a lot of communities, particularly communities of color, um, where they just don't have the representation they need because they don't have the voting power. So that's a huge one. And then there also are other barriers in Tennessee. We see voter ID restrictions. We see first time voters can't vote in person. We see college students can't use their state issue college ID to vote. And, um, and then we see currently we see that um, people have to choose between their health and their right to vote. In, in order to be able to vote, um, so, or to vote in person. So uh, there are a lot of issues going on and I, I think probably everyone else on the panel can probably piggyback on that with other issues as well. So if we think about it, I was looking at the numbers, 59% um, of Tennessee voters are women and 57 percent of the voters in Metro Davidson County um, are women. And so think about those numbers as we are thinking about voting um, and capacity and ability. So I want to answer that question. You said, what 
some of the issues or barriers. And I want to look at it um, in, in two different veins. And I want to cite um, the Chicago Defender. So when, you know, Rebecca did a great job giving us this historic perspective. So the Chicago Defender in 1920s, um, there was an article published that mentioned 500 warrants were issued against African-American women. So 500 people, 500 African-American women who were fearful um, to register vote. And so they were allegedly illegally registering. So if we think about 100 years ago, 500 warrants in just a small county, fast forward to that, you know, we see after 2008, 30 states introduced voter suppression legislation. We know that only 16 states um, took those measures or whether that's early voting or whether that's um, voting ID. Think about the number, 15% of all Americans right now who earn less than $35,000 a year do not have a state-issued ID. And so as long as there are barriers such as voter ID, with 15% of the people eligible to vote who do not vote because of ID, we'll always be talking about these types of barriers. Um, one, and then moving from the historic perspective, thinking about organizations and what people are doing um, to move beyond some of those barriers. You know, you have organizations all around the country. You know, we have groups like hashtag Black Women Vote looking at this collective voting power. We have Black women who are forming organizations to support and encourage Black women to run for office, not only run, but to maximize their political power. We have groups all around the country who are getting candidates ready um, and getting communities ready to gear up to fight, um, but not looking at just one particular party, but also looking at the power of, 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 of philanthropy, looking at the power of labor unions, looking at the power of community influencers. And so here we are a century later, and women are still demanding and asking for these rights. And, and several African-American organizations are continuing to do that beyond 45 years past the Voting Rights Act. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Rebecca, you want to add anything to that? You know, I was just thinking about this from the historical point of view and that idea of what, you know, um, how, how what, what has changed and, and what hasn't. And, you know, listening to um, all the different ways you can still continue to um, suppress the vote, uh, all the different ways we see in contemporary times, the way that you uh, can control who's voting and access to the ballot. And uh, just kind of putting together a little bit of what Debbie said and a little bit of what Andrea said about this, you know, this idea of voter education. Um, but then how are we continuing to work for um, protecting the vote? And I'm going to put these two together um, and tie it back to, again, this long work of women and political activity. Um, we now know, you know, in our, in our day and age, we have things like get out the vote, rock the vote, voter registration drives, voter education. The League of Women Voters still does that. That's one of their missions is to educate people on that. That is something that came out of women's work. Um, and not just the League of Women Voters, but African-American women are doing this work prior to 1920. They are involved in what we would call get out the vote work, what we would recognize as that. Um, led and led predominantly by the um, African-American educators, the teachers. They are trying to keep and work um, for African-American men to retain the vote. Um, they're working collectively as a community to keep the vote um, since African-American men can vote um, with the reconstruction amendments and then you know they immediately start to state laws get passed that start to suppress those votes. So African-American women are doing this for decades before the 1920s getting involved in these things and making sure that African-American men uh, can get registered, paying their poll taxes, doing fundraising drives and things like that. So when we think about now the work people are doing, that activists are doing to make sure that barriers aren't put into place um, and how do we get those different barriers down? I just think of the long work of women who've been doing this for 100, 150 years, trying to get access to that ballot. Because we're, we're, you know, we're a nation of laws. Um, and that's how we experience our freedoms um, and what we define as our freedoms, um, both individual and collectively. Um, so they've been doing this work for, for centuries. Um, this idea of, of getting access to that ballot and how to and how to protect it. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also want to, Debbie, I want you to mention, because when we were talking about this before, just another thing um, in contemporary times is the, um, that there are the um, naturalization ceremonies aren't taking place right now. Exactly. Yes, that's true. Uh, because of the pandemic, naturalization ceremonies aren't taking place. And there literally are people who've met all the requirements and are not going to, you know, unless, unless we speed this up, they're not going to be able to vote in the presidential election. So there are, are lots of lots and lots of barriers. But I also wanted to go back a little bit to, to your point, Rebecca, about sort of this history of, of women's organizations that we have historically inherited. And there was one, one um, bill that came up in 1921, I thought it really sort of exemplified what that background of systematic organization of women's groups state by state across the country leading up to suffrage and what it meant. Because so much of that work um, the volunteer work really focused on a lot of um, women's issues around um, health issues and public health issues and child labor laws and so forth. In 1921, the sh there was a Shepherd Town Towner Maternity and Infancy Protection Act that was passed in 1921, so it was immediately after women got the vote. But what was interesting to me about it was that it required a state match. Doesn't this always sound familiar? Like we're always dealing with a state match on whether you can pull down federal funds. But in order to get this passed, women's suffrage groups started essentially using their same organizational tools to work with state legislatures to get the match. And they were successful in 44 of the 48 states. So it was the same skill set that they had, but they had the additional, not just the, the motivational power, but they also had the power of the vote to push those legislators to take action. And I thought that was really interesting that it's the same, it's the same values, the same skill set and work. So. Still doing it today. Still doing it today. Still doing it today. <laughs> That's right. And we're going to talk more about that in a bit, but I wanted to uh, put our attention. I think, Marilyn, are you finished with the stripe? I am. The Tennessee <laughs> stripe is on. Tennessee, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. So we're going to pull this all out, and I am going to kind of walk through her flag. I tried to involve as many women as possible in this project. And um, so I used a pin cushion made by a woman in each state as well. And this pin cushion was made by Yulia Anderson and she's from Memphis and it says voter on it. So I love that, you know, the final pin cushion has voter. So I have 36 handmade pin cushions that are glorious to look at. And if you go to our Instagram feed, you can scroll through, um, and see more of these pin cushions. So I'm gonna set this down real quick. Okay, so let's hoist this sucker up. Can we do it? Let's do it. Holy cow, this feels good. We've been, we're filming for a documentary today as well. And uh, I saw a little preview and I learned that I say incredible a lot. <laughs> I need to not use that word as much. So I'm just going to kick off and start talking. So the very first stripe is Wisconsin, and it was made by Jenny Gow. The first all-female school board was sworn in last year, and Jenny wanted to depict this exciting moment. She believes that through education, change is possible. So she's got the, um, the entire uh, school board uh, depicted on her stripe. And I know you can't see it all. You're going to have to go to herflag.com where we have all the stripes and all the artist statements. So I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit and you can go to the website and check everything out in detail. So the second stripe is Illinois by Judith Mayer. And her artwork was inspired by Wonder Woman comics. The third stripe, Michigan by Ann Lewis. Her stripe features important years in the history of voting rights for all peoples, such as 1952 when Japanese Americans gained the vote and the landmark Voting Rights Act passed in 1965 that was instrumental in expanding the power of the ballot for African Americans. And the powerful quote attributed to Sojourner Truth, Ain't I a Woman and a Sister. 
The Kansas stripe is fourth by Jennifer Hudson. Her stripe was hand painted and has the Latin state motto that means to the stars through difficulty. She has a white woman depicted on one side of her stripe and an African American woman on the other. The New York stripe is fifth by Indira Cic uh, Cicerine. Her India ink paintings are tributes to women of the suffrage fight that were important in New York as well as nationally. Ohio, the sixth stripe is by Lindsay Scott. She has women of yesterday and today depicted on either sides of her stripe. Love her inclusive approach like so many of the artists. She has women of all races represented. The seventh stripe is Pennsylvania by M Jamila Walgren. She has a cycle of a young girl of color seeing a woman like her holding a position of public office that repeats into her being the woman in office. Ugh, it's so awesome. <laughs> the eighth stripe is Massachusetts by Carrie Percival. She did a ton of research on the history of suffrage in her home state. Each scene depicts an actual event of the fight. The style uh, uh, she used was silhouettes, which is a nod to the past during the quest for the ballot. The Night Stripe is Texa, Texas by Mila Sketch, and she's a Russian immigrant, and she chose to highlight a few important women in Texas history. The Tenth Stripe is Iowa by Annie Swarm Goldberg. She took inspiration from the suffrage sashes that were worn by the women of the period in the making of her stripe. The Eleventh Stripe is Missouri by Rory DeRine. She depicts the Golden Lane, and this is especially appropriate this week which was a nonviolent protest organized for the 1960 Democratic National Convention held in St. Louis. That event had women from local suffrage organizations held, holding yellow umbrellas outside the entrance to the convention in the hopes to pressure Democrats to adopt a non-suffrage stance. Also depicted are members of the Osage and Missouri tribes uh, who, were, who would lose their rights under European colonization. Sacred Sun from the Osage Tribe and Sacagawea of the Lemmy Shoshone are represented on the left side of her stripe. The 12th stripe is Arkansas by Via, Via Marie de Posner. Her, uh, she has women of all races depicted on her stripe and she is uh, of Puerto Rican descent. The 13th stripe is Montana by Jane Wagner Deschner. The long photograph in this stripe is a group portrait of the 65th U.S. Congress in front of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. There's a sea of men, and there's one woman, Jeanette Rankin. She was the very first woman ever in either chamber of Congress, and this was in 1917. She was a representative of her state, but at the time could not vote in a national election. The 14th stripe, Nebraska, is by Cindy Chin. She powerfully uh, highlights the eyes of women that were important in Nebraska's fight for suffrage. The 15th stripe is Minnesota by Annie Uke. She created a contemporary design inspired by the natural world with images of women woven into the stripe. The 16th stripe is New Hampshire by Nicole LaRue. She created the National Women's March on Washington iconic logo we all know now, and her stripe has the bold for all womankind statement in the center. Hang on a minute. The 17th stripe, Utah, by Jan Hayworth. The images with the bold line from the poem by Mary Oliver, and it's, let's see, let me find it real quick so I can read it. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Uh, in the poem by Mary Oliver, she, it is filled, those, those letters are filled with over 300 portraits of women as part of the world work in progress mural that uh, Jan was a part of that hundreds of Americans have contributed to. The 18th stripe is the California stripe and it's by Rora Blue and it has the iconic uh, women, I voted sticker and the fist emojis as a comment on how digital culture and technology has become a prominent part of voting and politics. The 19th stripe is, by, is Maine, and it's by Amy Kennedy. She is our only retired veteran of the armed services in this project. She has filled suffrage photos within the letters of her statement. The miles under their heels led to where we stand. I'm gonna try and not cry. <laughs> uh, 
the 20th stripe is North Dakota by Darby Ness, and she's the youngest artist in our project, just barely out of art school. Her quote uh, is from a well-known suffrage fighter in her home state, and it says, the big world is watching and learning and admiring, and pretty soon the job will be done. The 21st stripe is South Dakota by Claire Lockhart. She used dinosaurs to represent suffrage fighters. She often uses humor in her work uh, it, to make serious subjects approachable. The 22nd stripe is Colorado by Susan Cooper. Her stripe has a whole assortment of women from the last hundred years that have contributed to improving the rights for all Americans. The 23rd stripe is Kentucky by uh, Linda Edinger. She created mixed media collage pieces out of recycled materials and photographed them to create her stripe. She added bold type on top of the collaged images. The 24th stripe is Rhode Island by Allison Cole. It depicts women of the suffrage era on the left and contemporary women on the right. The floral scrolls to the left and right of the Rhode Island text in the middle are referent to the masthead of the UNA, one of the first feminist newspapers owned, written, and edited entirely by women. The 25th stripe is Oregon by Davida Fernandez. The letters making up Oregon occur at each point in the timeline when the question of voting for, for the rights for women was placed on the ballot in Oregon, Oregon six times, 1884, 1900, 1906, 1908, 1910, 1912. Abigail Scott Dunaway, the controversial mo mother of the, room of the movement in Oregon, observes from either side of her stripe. The 26th stripe is Indiana by Bonnie Fillenworth. Suffragist hoser, hosers are, are, are repeated throughout uh, the state uh, name as well. The 27th stripe is Wyoming by Beth Garman Merkel. Scanned pieces from her grandmother's quilt fabric and layered drawings of women uh, that have been instrumental in her life are part of her stripe. The 28th stripe is Nevada by Lisa Jean Allsweed. Found vintage images and suff of suffrage interest. She found these, she printed them on paper and then stitched them together with her sewing machine. Lisa loves creating layers of entangled stitching within her art making practice. The 29th stripe is New Jersey by Donna Basin. She invited people into her studio and using an assortment of patriotic props, uh, however they choose, and then she photographed them. So there's hundreds of Americans on that stripe. The 30th stripe is Idaho by Vina Domingo, and it depicts a woman from the suffrage era reaching out to a woman from today, along with other elements related to her, to her state and suffrage. The 31st stripe is Arizona by Talisa uh, Lopez Garcia, and she depicts a joyful image of a woman of color. The 32nd stripe is New Mexico, Laurel Garcia Colvin. Her stripe depicts, depicts many important figures in the struggle for voting rights in the state of New Mexico, such as Michael Trujillo Sr. Portrayed with his daughter, he was a member of the Esleta uh, Pueblo, a Marine sergeant in World War II and an educator when he tried to register to vote in June 1948. Though Native Americans were granted citizenship for the federal, by the federal government in 1924, the New Mexico Constitution barred Native Americans from voting. Trujillo filed a lawsuit and won his case uh, on August 3rd, 1948, thus securing Native Americans the, uh, the, vote to right, the right to vote in New Mexico. The 33rd stripe is the Oklahoma stripe by Denise DeWong. She drew women bound at the edges of her stripe that as they evolve into the center, begin to loosen their constraints. The 34th stripe is West Virginia by Savannah Scroll Goose. She created portraits of important citizens of West Virginia's suffrage fight, as well as all the dates that voting for women came to the legislation before the actual passing in 1920. The 35th stripe is Washington by Erin Shigaki. She represents the state of Washington as a woman and an Asian American part of two communities prohibited from voting for many years in the United States. Women won the right to vote in 1920, but federal, federal policy barred immigrants of Asian descent from becoming US citizens until 1962. And then we have Higgins Bond stripe, Tennessee stripe. Uh, and I'm gonna read her artist statement. 
In my pencil drawing, I wanted to honor some of my heroes of the long journey of women's rights, not just the fight for the vote, but also the fight to no longer be seen as second-class citizens. They are, left to right, Ida B. Wells, editor, businesswoman, woman's rights leader, and a prolific and influential writer. She used her highly successful uh, newspaper columns to spread the gospel of her anti-lynching crusade and promote equal rights. She was a founding member of the NAACP. Mary Church Terrell is next depicted, spending her life fighting for the rights for blacks and women. A pioneer educator and activist who organized black women in their fight against racism and sexism. She helped to establish the National Association of Colored Women in 1895. Rosa Parks is known as the mother of the civil rights movement. Her refusal to give up her seat on a segregated bus and sub subsequ subsequently arrest, uh, arrested uh, Arrest sparked the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott by blacks. Led by Dr. Mar Dr. Martin Luther King, the boycott soon drew into the freedom movement that helped end segregated public ac uh, accommodations throughout the South. Ella Baker, a brilliant organizer and activist, she helped to create the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She al was also instrumental in the success of the Montgomery bus boycott. And Fannie Lou Hamer, she was one of the major figures of the freedom movement. The civil rights activist was a pivotal voice in the Freedom Democracy Party. Born a sharecropper, she and her family endured violence after attempting to register to vote. But, they, but that only strengthened her resolve to change things. She was a founder, organizer, spokeswoman, and a, an elected representative of the Mississippi Freedom Democracy Party, formed to give disenfranchised black citizens an organized political voice. Oh. <laughs> okay, that's just a little taste of what's in her flag. And please go to the website to really delve in. Um, it took an army of men and women to make this project happen. And I, it would take me 30 minutes to list all of the people that I am, will be indebted to for the rest of my life for being a part of this project and making my dream come true. Um, the big announcement that I have, other than finishing the project, is that I am uh, I'm gonna race home and get the grommets added and then I'm gonna race to Little Rock Arkansas and on Women's Equality Day August 26 her flag will pre be premiered on the outside of the C Clinton presidential library so uh, a really glorious place for it to be premiered and um, yeah super excited about that Please follow us on Instagram and Facebook um, at HerFlag2020. And please, everybody, vote. Use your power. Use your power for good. And I want to thank the Tennessee Performing Arts Center um, for allowing us to be in this incredible auditorium. I wish you were all here with me in person. So I, I left a, a five minutes left. So um, I'm going to hand it back over. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. I can't believe how, I mean, it looks huge. It is huge. Yeah, I wish, I wish you could see it in person. It looks good, um, how, how virtually. What are, what are the measurements of it? It's 18 feet by 26 feet. And that was only allowing six inches for the artist to work with. I mean, that's challenging. Yeah. Six inches, that's not a lot. Yeah, Higgins, I would love your reaction. How, do you, how does this feel? It's overwhelming. You know, one thing I wanted to say, when they first asked me to participate in this, I thought about the AIDS quilt. It was a performance art piece that put together a lot of different artists and a lot of different works of art. And that's what this is. It's a conglomeration of a lot of different people and a lot of different ways of expressing themselves about this subject. So um, I thought it was a very important thing to be a part of, and I'm really proud of it. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, we have a question in the chat for you Higgins and and there um, it's somebody's son who's wondering how old were you when you first voted when when was that do you remember oh gosh i can't remember <laughs> i think probably at 21 i mean i graduated from um, the memphis college of art and moved to new jersey and i think um, that was probably uh, the first time i voted at 21 
it's, yeah. it's hard to yeah. remember yeah. Yeah. back then. And you were in New Jersey. New Jersey, yes. <laughs> and Rebecca, Debbie, I would love your your opinions, your thoughts on this. This is this is a crazy, wonderful day. And for those of you who saw the reenactment earlier at the Capitol online, and now you know, so we got to see kind of look into a piece of history, and now we're looking at today and it's just it's, it is overwhelming it's very emotional um, i would say that one thing that that i feel when i look at this is to see how many many different names and voices are represented mm -hmm. and the idea that and and i think rebecca probably would agree with me on this very often we try and make history history sound very streamlined, that there's one hero, that there's one antagonist, and it's solved. And this shows the complexity of the whole process and the complexity of multiple voices coming in at different times in this whole process. Yes, and uh, Marilyn, we have a quick question for you. How long from start to finish did this take? So I came up with the idea in 2017. So I have been working on this project since 2017. I'm a little tired. <laughs> Should be. Just a little bit tired. Should be. Congratulations. Uh, but Congratulations. Um, and we have another question. How can our how can we encourage our young teen daughters? How can we inspire them to get involved? What can mm. we do? I'd love to hear from each of you. Starting with Andrea. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. I think um, I'm, that's what I'm most excited about today. The fact that, you know, the public library will unveil its permanent space today where young people, particularly young girls and women, will have um, spaces, whether it's virtual or in, you know, in the library, that we can um, start looking at those issues that impact girls and women, and they get to define their own politica, ag political agenda. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm most excited about, making sure that young people, these young girls, have their place and have their space, and so that their voices will be heard, and they can continue to pick up the mantle of all of the women that we see on that flag. That's wonderful. Anyone else? Um, I think I'd say that we just want all young people to understand there are lots of different ways to be part of a community and whether it's marching, whether it's voting, whether it's speaking out in public about issues, those are all important and we just need to help people find their right voice. Rebecca, anything to add? Oh, you got to unmute yourself first. I just echo what Andrea and Debbie said. Um, I think it's really important, you know, as young voters, when they are defining, you know, who they are and, and what kind of citizen that they want to be, you know, it's just really important for them to understand, you know, what they're, what's important to them. Um, and it's, it's what I try to do in the work with Chick History and when we work with young people is, is um, understanding that they're going to come into this on their own terms, through their own experiences and through their own lived experiences. Um, and it's really through that that they'll start to, you know, really understand and get an appreciation for history, but, you know, where they are um, in this long, long, long narrative. And that's when I, where I really see um, really inspiring work when I, when I work with young people is talking to them about what matters to them and where they would like to see things go and what they think they can contribute. And I, I, what Debbie said was so important is, um, understanding all the different myriad roles that a citizen can play in democracy um, and, and which role you, know, you, want, you want to play. There's so many. So just because you're not doing one thing doesn't mean you're not participating. I think that's an important thing, um, like Andrea said, in these conversations that we have with, with um, younger audiences is all the different ways you can participate and they're all equally important um, as we move these this forward you know i think for me it's about it's about education it's about that's where we start you know that's where we learn to care that's when we learn about the history when we learn about the impact when we learn about democracy um then it, it you know then you learn to care you learn to that your voice matters 
So education is so important in valuing women's history, which is obviously really important to me. Women are not equally represented when a young girl opens up a history book. We're not in there as much. And until that is really fixed, um, you know, a, a young woman opening up a book has a problem from the get-go because she doesn't see herself. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations, Marilyn and Higgins. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to everybody who came and to participate with us today. Again, Marilyn, we wish we could be with you in person, but we're so glad that you gave us the opportunity to, to do this virtually. Yeah, um, absolutely. Have safe travels back home and for our Nashville people and for Higgins, you have, have safe travels back to your house in Nashville. Yes. And, um, and we'll see you all soon, hopefully in the theater, but if not, we will see you virtually. So thank you again and congratulations. Happy, Please. happy anniversary, everyone. <laughs> thank you for having us. Votes for women, <laughs> suffrage. <laughs> <laughs>